This week's episode is brought to you by Casper. Casper is a sleep brand that makes expertly designed products to help you get your best rest one night at a time. At Casper, mattresses are cleverly designed for humans, engineered to mimic human curves, providing supportive comfort for all kinds of bodies. You spend one third of your life sleeping, so you should be comfortable, and Casper mattresses provide all the support the human body needs in all the right places. Casper brand mattresses combine multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface with the right amounts of both sink and bounce. They have three designs to choose from. The original Casper mattress, which combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface. The Wave, which features a patent-pending premium support system to mirror the natural shape of your body. And the Essential, which has a streamlined design at a price that won't keep you up at night. And whatever Casper mattress you decide to go with, the price will be affordable because Casper cuts out the middleman and sells directly to you with free shipping in the United States and Canada. And if for some reason you don't like it, they offer hassle-free returns if you're not completely satisfied. Now, of course, we have recently moved across the Atlantic, but the Casper mattress that we've had all these years was still of such great quality that my mom put a special tag on it and it migrated over to her house. It's now their guest and napping bed. So... The deal we have for you is that you get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash revolutions and using the promo code revolutions at checkout. That again, $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash revolutions and using the promo code revolutions. Terms and conditions apply. Hello, and welcome to Revolutions. Episode 9.12, No Peace. So as you may have noticed if you look at the runtime, this week's episode is shorter than usual. If you follow me on Twitter, you know that this is thanks to a series of disasters that befell my family as we attempted to leave Auvergne on Monday. Not only did we get blasted by a massive snowstorm, but our rental car broke down. It broke down in the middle of a blizzard. This left us stranded for three days in the little village of Mazé Savoie. Since I produced this show in real time, that pretty much crushed my ability to pull out a full episode this week, so here we are with a much shorter episode. But before we get going, I do want to say that the people of Mazé Savoie were wonderful to us, especially after we were more or less abandoned by our rental car company. So, for example, if you are ever in Mazé, please go to the Auberge du Soleil. The owners there took care of us with generous warmth, and, in the end, got one of their friends, just one of their friends, to drive us to Saint-Étienne to catch a train because we literally had no other means of transportation. So I won't bore you with all of the stressful details, but suffice it to say, we got screwed, and the Auberge du Soleil in Massé saint bois was quite literally our shelter from the storm. Okay, so getting back to the Mexican Revolution, here in this truncated episode, we are going to address the situation Francisco Madero inherited when he finally became president of Mexico. Specifically, we are going to focus on the array of revolts and rebellions that continued to flare up across the country. Because as much as Madero was trying to put the revolution behind him and behind Mexico, the Mexican Revolution is nowhere near its end. We're barely even halfway through this series. The situation was in fact so seamlessly volatile that after Madero's election in October of 1911, it was decided the country could not wait for his scheduled inauguration on December the 1st. Instead, interim president de la Barra resigned on November the 6th, and Madero was officially sworn in. So, he was finally President Madero. But from the minute he took up his office, he dealt with a rash of insurrections and conspiratorial challenges to his rule. From random local uprisings led by ambitious bandits now styling themselves revolutionary caudillos to reactionary coup plots hatched in the inner circles of the old Porfiriato, the Madero administration never enjoyed a moment's peace. Now, of course, the most famous and most important of these ongoing insurrections is the one led by Emiliano Zapata in Morelos. But I will be putting off our discussion of Zapata until next week, because it requires more time and attention than I will be able to give it this week. But please just remember that Zapata has been driven into rebellion by the aggressive conduct of General Huerta and the Figueroa brothers, and will soon be issuing the famous, bordering on legendary, Plan of Ayala at the end of November 1911. We will talk all about that in detail next week. Now, in terms of physical proximity, the rebellion in Morelos was very close to the presidential palace in Mexico City. 
but even closer were disgruntled former Porfirians. After Madero's election, credible evidence was passed along to American Ambassador Henry Lane Wilson that a plot was being hatched among conservative army officers to prevent Madero from ever taking office, even if that meant assassinating him. Subsequent investigations led to the arrest of two generals who confessed to everything at the end of December, which led to the subsequent discovery of a huge explosives cache, proving that this was no pack of paranoid rumors. In fact, the plan may have been executed had General Huerta not been fired from his job for driving Morelos back into insurrectionary chaos again. We'll talk about that next week. But though Madero did not want to confront this very dire and very persistent threat of a reactionary military coup, he really did seem to want to put his head in the sand about it, that threat is not going to go away. And U.S. Ambassador Henry Lane Wilson, a conservative Republican who thought Madero was quite literally a lunatic and represented the thin end of the wedge of, like, anarcho-communism in North America, is going to be far less interested in passing along evidence of such coups in the future. In fact, he might even signal that the United States would not look unkindly on such a coup. At the end of 1911, though, these kinds of barracks plots were not considered by the Maderistas to be the chief threat to Madero because, just like President Diaz, they focused their attention on the threat posed by Bernardo Reyes. Reyes, remember, had withdrawn from the presidential race in a theatrical huff, declaring it corrupt and rigged. He went up to San Antonio and seemed to make very little effort to hide the fact that he was now organizing a counter-revolution to overthrow Madero, who Reyes denounced as an incompetent, treacherous hypocrite. But unlike many of his supporters and advisors, Madero himself was apparently quite serene about the threat posed by Reyes, and confidently asserted that Reyes would not get anywhere with his counter-revolution. And unlike his serene disbelief about the threat of a military coup, Madero was proven 100% correct about Reyes. The hype of Bernardo Reyes never ever lived up to his actual performance, as would be shown again over the course of November and December 1911. For one thing, as I just said, Reyes was not being very subtle about what he was up to. So, again, following a bit in the footsteps of President Diaz, President Madero demanded the United States take action. Except this time, instead of dragging their feet, the Americans took action. The Taft administration's official policy had always been that everyone needed to adhere to America's neutrality laws. Foreign nationals were not allowed to use the United States as a staging ground for revolution in their home countries. Now, of course, Madero had gotten like a six-month free pass and he was just able to act freely, but I need to make a couple points about this. First, he moved around enough and had enough support, especially among the Tejano population, that it was legitimately difficult to keep track of him. And then also, despite President Diaz's huffing and puffing, it took a long time for his agents to produce the kind of legal proof that was going to move the very lawyerly and by-the-book President Taft. Meanwhile, the Mataristas, having just staged a revolution from Texas themselves, knew exactly what to look for, and they were able to put together a pile of evidence that Reyes was gathering arms and men for an invasion of Mexico probably prodded further along by a desire to not let Mexico redescend into civil war, the American authorities actually acted quickly. Reyes and his entourage were arrested in late November 1911, and the army was ordered to the border to prevent illegal crossings in either direction. Released on bail, Reyes concluded it would only be a matter of time before he was arrested again. With his plan for an invasion going nowhere, Reyes, practically all by himself, crossed the border back into Mexico near Eagle Pass on December the 4th. But the thing is, this whole time, Reyes has been deluding himself. He may have once been the popular governor of Nuevo León, and the best possible candidate to inherit the Porfiriato, but there was no widespread popular clamoring to go back to the Porfiriato now that it was over. Reyes was trying to pitch counter-revolution to a population in northern Mexico that is just not interested, and the one place where he might have been able to garner personal support, which was his old home base in Nuevo León, was now under the military command of General Trevino. Remember General Trevino, the old guy who had been recalled by Diaz to take over the 3rd Military District of Mexico, specifically to prevent Reyes from being able to raise a military insurrection there? Well, Trevino did his job very well, and was continuing to do his job very well. 
Reyes had no friends in high places. He had no friends in the military. Certainly, he had no friends with guns. There was simply no possibility of a Reyista uprising in Nuevo Leon. The state was on lockdown. For two weeks after his escape across the border, though, Bernardo Reyes was off the grid, sending both American and Mexican officials hunting down rumors that put him anywhere from Mexico City to New York City. In reality, he was up in the rugged northern country moving south and trying to build an army. But the people were not into it. As Reyes himself later complained, whenever he arrived in some town, men did not flock to his banner. They ran to the nearest telegraph office to report to the government on his whereabouts. So after a couple of weeks of this, going nowhere with absolutely no one, Reyes gave up. He quit. On Christmas Day 1911, he turned himself into a local garrison. Once he was in custody, he asked the government for blanket amnesty for himself and anyone who had supported him, which, you know, not that many people. But Madero was not interested. He had magnanimously let Reyes return to Mexico, and Reyes had thanked him by trying to overthrow him. So any low-level supporters who had been caught up in the Reyes scheme were pardoned, but Reyes himself was going to be tried for sedition and treason. And so he was subsequently transferred to an army brig in Mexico City to await trial. And there, Reyes would sit, once again proving that he simply did not have what it took to live up to his hype. But even though he now sat in jail after running an even more pathetic revolution than Madero had originally run, we are not done with Bernardo Reyes quite yet. Now, one of Reyes' big problems is that he was trying to run a popular counter-revolution in an area that had just been the theater of a popular revolution— But just because Reyes was making the wrong anti-Madero pitch, that doesn't mean there was not a pitch to be made. As we discussed last time, after quote-unquote his victory, Madero very quickly pivoted away from the ruffians who had actually won the war for him, and he tried to graduate into respectable politics. This left many of those who had joined him feeling abandoned and betrayed. If they had any real political bent at all, They were also grousing about Madero's conservative turn, and they wanted the points of the plan of San Luis more forthrightly asserted. But plenty of them were all but apolitical, adventurous sorts who groused not about high ideals, but about being shafted out of the spoils of war. They wanted power. They wanted offices. The just rewards for the risks that they had taken. The just rewards for the war that they had won. These types of jilted ex-rebels and ex-Mataristas all across central and northern Mexico were cultivated not by Reyes, but by the Vasquez Gomez brothers. Last time, we saw Francisco Vasquez Gomez maneuvered out of the vice presidency following a very public and acrimonious break with Madero. Well, Francisco has a brother named Emilio, who, even though we haven't talked about him yet, had been tapped to be the Minister of the Interior in the interim government. Well, Emilio Vasquez Gomez had been forced out of that office just around the same time Madero was forcing Francisco Vasquez Gomez off his presidential ticket. So both brothers now had bitter axes to grind. And in the next stage, Francisco would actually take a back seat to his younger brother Emilio, who stepped up to lead the family attack on Madero. Making a base for themselves in Texas, just like Reyes was doing, Emilio Vasquez Gomez wrote a report that he sent to all the state governors of Mexico, denouncing Madero for not having gone far enough in implementing the plan of San Luis. In effect, Madero had betrayed his own revolution. Vasquez Gomez was now portraying himself as the real leader of the revolutionary movement, saying he was more Maderista than Madero himself. So, like Reyes, Vasquez Gomez denounced the recent election as a farce and declared the result illegitimate. He said that if asked, he might consider serving as provisional president to see new free and fair elections held. The circular, though, did not have much impact on the state governors. After all, most of them had just become state governors thanks to Madero's approval. I mean, why bite the hand that feeds you? But out among the rustic northern ex-rebels said, it became generally known that Vasquez Gomez was offering to make himself the figurehead of a movement that might still be worth supporting. I mean, Madero had gone off to Mexico City and was now not even returning their phone calls. I mean, what the heck is up with that? But just to get this out of the way right now, Emilio Vasquez Gomez, whatever he's setting himself up to be, was never going to create some Vasquista rebel army. 
he and his brother were simply not charismatic enough or well-connected enough or trusted enough to be anything more than a name vaguely connected to vague anti-Madero sentiment. But there was a guy among that disaffected, jilted, northern ex-rebel set who was charismatic enough and well-connected enough and trusted enough to be more than just a name, and that was Pascual Orozco. Orozco was at this moment being recruited, flattered, and cultivated by every single enemy Francisco Madero ever had. Everyone recognized how important Orozco had been to the original revolution. Everyone knew that he was pissed at Madero. The Vasquistas had been trying to recruit him to the cause, knowing that he could prove hugely decisive. But Orozco mostly resisted their appeals. Not that he didn't appreciate their efforts or remain angry at his treatment by Madero. After being appointed governor of Chihuahua, Abraham Gonzalez had then run in an open election later in 1911 to secure a true democratic mandate, and a group of anti-Madero interests, including some Vasquistas, tried to put Orozco forward as a rival candidate for the governorship. But a judge ruled him ineligible because he was not yet 30 years old, which was just another obnoxious slight. I mean, I'm old enough to win the war for you, but now I'm too young to serve in government? Then, after Madero won his election, the new president tapped his old faithful friend Abraham Gonzalez to serve as Minister of the Interior, and Orozco once again held out some hope he would be named governor of Chihuahua when Gonzalez left for Mexico City. But Gonzalez merely took a leave of absence from his office without resigning, and the caretaker governorship went to some dude no one had ever heard of. And so a smoldering Orozco continued to be courted by Madero's enemies. In late January and early February 1912, the dissatisfaction among Madero's former soldiers finally broke into open revolt in the north. A close revolutionary comrade of Orozco's named Braulio Hernandez, a former college professor and journalist turned rebel officer, decided that he had had enough of Madero embracing their old enemies and crapping on his old friends. Hernandez issued a manifesto in the first week of February demanding Madero resign the presidency, and at least ostensibly, announced his support for Emilio Vasquez Gomez to become provisional president. And though this was technically an anti-Maderista revolt, Alan Knight points out that it is much better described as a neo-Maderista revolt. This is not a counter-revolution. This was a continuation of the revolution. The chief has betrayed the cause. Hernandez lobbied his old comrade Orozco to join the rebellion, but as late as the end of February 1912, Orozco was still defending the Maderista government from rebellion, even as Hernandez secured the defection of garrisons in Chihuahua City and Casas Grandes, and then occupied Juarez. But at some crucial moment between the last week of February and the first week of March, Orozco changed his mind. When federal forces attempt to reassert control of Juarez on March the 3rd, Orozco rode out at the head of a rebel army to repel them. But crucially, Orozco had failed in his own attempt to coax a critical ally over to the renewed rebellion, because leading those federal forces attempting to retake Juarez was Orozco's former lieutenant, Pancho Villa, who had concluded that his fortunes were better served by defending Madero than attacking him. And boy, was Villa ever right. With instincts that remind me of no one so much as Toussaint Louverture, Villa chose wisely and was now on his way to becoming the man of the North. But that story is going to wait until next week, because, friends, I have no more time this week. So we'll pick this all back up again next time when our regularly scheduled programming resumes. We will see Pascual Orozco and Emiliano Zapata trying to keep the Mexican Revolution going, and men like Bernardo Reyes and General Huerta trying to kill the Mexican Revolution dead. And Francisco Madero, as is his tragic lot in life, will continue to be stuck right in the middle. Mm-hmm.